Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our Safety Success Stories and Lessons Learned conversation this afternoon. I am Bobby McAllister, and I will be your moderator for today's session. This meeting is now being recorded. We are joined by a panel of presenters led by our very own Josiah Roldan, Employee Safety and Risk Manager. Prior to joining the ODOT family, he was the Director of Safety and Security at Oregon State Hospital and also a professor at Oregon State University in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. Please visit the Fall Forum website to learn more about Josiah and the other members of our panel. If you have questions, you can visit Slido, www.slido.com, or you can download the app on your smart uh, device and enter the event code Safety Stories. Also, uh, please ensure that your microphone is on mute when not speaking um, and stay engaged and enjoy the session. Josiah? Bobby, thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone. I recognize that this is the last portion of the fall form before the end of the day. So uh, thanks for making it this far and I thank you for your participation. Um, so today's presentation is on safety success stories and lessons learned. Um, uh, from the and for those that don't know me, I work in the Office of Employee Safety. And, you know, one of our core values that I, that really attracted me to ODOT is safety. And for you, it, what that, for us, what that means is we share ownership and responsibility for ensuring safety in all that we do every day, right? So we try to live by that core value, which is very important. Um, and for me, ownership and self-responsibility, I feel, are two important elements that all of our employees um, really must embrace for us to improve and advance our safety culture. And it also requires our workers to be both proactive and also innovative in finding solutions to safety problems that we face every day in our work. So today's presentation is really um, to highlight um, five success stories throughout the agency in, my, in what I believe are perfect examples of how our core values of, of safety is put to practice every day and are good testament to how we're advancing our safety culture. So the five um, presenters and topics that will be uh, presented today are the temporary rumble strips and I'll give the presentation um, speakers name when we get there. Uh, we'll talk about the COVID-19 facility reintegration and employee safety, railroad safety, safety learning groups, then hazard and alert system pilot. And then certainly we'll have the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So the first uh, uh, speakers that we have to talk about temporary rumble strips is Mike Werner, who is a transportation maintenance manager from Region 5. And this topic was also recommended um, by Cameron McGinnis, who is a safety manager from Region 5. So um, I will stop talking and give it over to Mike Werner. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you. So this will be pretty short and sweet. Um, the use of uh, temporary rumble strips. Jordan Valley and Basque ODOT have been using temporary rumble strips for three years. They are ideal for temporary work zones with a life expectancy of three to five years under normal conditions. Normal conditions would be flat roadways consisting of asphalt and concrete. Installation. For the installation, we have a basket that mounts to the receiver hitch on our crew truck. The rumble strips fold in half into the basket. The crew members just drag the rumble strips out of the basket and then vice versa to load them. It takes two crew members less than 30 minutes to set up. For crew members that have installed them a few times, it takes less time than that. For speeds up to 70 miles per hour, you space the three sets of rumble strips 20 feet apart. For speeds below 70 miles per hour, the rumble strips will be placed closer together depending on the speeds. Place a rumble strips ahead sign after the road work ahead sign. The benefits to the rumble strips is the effectiveness in alerting drivers of construction zones and other hazards. It provides both an audible warning 
to motorists as well as alerting the flaggers of the vehicle's presence. It increases the driver's awareness, helping them to pay attention to temporary construction signs and speed limits. As you watch the vehicles drive over the rumble strips, you will see them apply their brakes and start to slow down. The rumble strips reduce the possibility of work zone crashes by making people more aware of their surroundings. And that is all I have on the temporary rumble strips. Um, does anybody have any questions? Mike, I think we're gonna try to hold off in the questions towards after all the presentations is, is over, if that's okay. Okay, sounds good. I'll add to that a couple of things. Um, it wasn't coincidence that Mike was talking about 70 miles an hour. You can see his, that's Highway 95 on the Oregon Idaho border. And it does have a 70 mile an hour. But law enforcement and any of those folks that work out there will tell you that speeds in excess of 100 have been clocked on a regular daily basis by law enforcement. So there's a real reason. Um, the crews have found them to be pretty useful, but Mike will tell you that there's some people that don't like them. Each of those sets uh, pinned together costs way about 60 pounds. So the crews hated and wouldn't use them when at first, and then the managers mandated that they use them. And when uh, one of the things they learned pretty soon is that they could hear cars, even if the rumble strip was over a rise somewhere. So there's been several crews that started to use them. They didn't have to be coerced, so to speak, because on the straight stretch of the road where the speed, where the public isn't paying attention, they do get their attention. But they are heavy. And um, but we won't tell you that everybody loves them. In Oregon construction drawings, detail 4715 is the drawing that shows you how to lay them out. Uh, hopefully in the next edition of the short-term traffic control book, that drawing will be added. If you're looking at that drawing, you'll see two sets of rumble strips. Um, our traffic engineers have allowed us just to set out one until we get done learning how to do it. So most crews are only putting out you know, one set of three rumble strips. Our construction crews are using them. Some of you may have be, be aware that they did a long-term project. It took two or three years on the mine and grade. And one end of the work zone was about a half mile below the summit of the mine and grade. And so they used rumble strips on the downhill side that contractors did because they had people coming around the corner and it work zone pretty quickly. So they're flexible and there's good ways to use them. You'll find out there's places where it makes a lot of sense and there's other places where experience will tell you you don't need to use them so much. Did I say anything inaccurate there, Mike? Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Cam. Thank you, Mike. Very good. Well, the next one um, is to really talk about the success we've had in, in responding to COVID-19. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Robert is not able to join us, so Scott will be talking on his behalf. Um, Scott is one of the um, safety managers here at the Office of Employee Safety. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Scott. Josiah, thank you. So I want to start off by saying thank you to all those folks that served on the COVID-19 task teams. Uh, your work was really instrumental in uh, giving our agency the ability to open back up safely. So thank you. It was a great body of work that was done. So when we talk about reintegration, you know, it's what is it? Uh, how was it developed? What are the things that came out of this uh, reintegration guide that was developed? So if we go back to May or June, in 2020, which honestly, I don't think anybody wants to go back in time with 2020. Um, yeah, I'd rather just go to bed and wake up in 2021. But if we go back to May or June, that's when ODOT business lines were starting to scale back because of COVID-19. We were looking at just essential tasks. Travel was very limited or, or eliminated completely. And some business lines like DMV were just completely shut down. And that's when we started to hear about this reintegration term. Uh, and in particular, the facilities reintegration guide. And so what was this guide? Um, it, it, it kind of outlines the activities that facilities is gonna implement so that we can safely open uh, the ODOT facilities and reduce the risk of COVID-19 for employees and customers. During the development of this document, um, we, I 
really want to stop for just a moment and recognize Lisa Letney, who worked for facilities at the time and was the main person to assemble all of the data and the information uh, into a, a readable document. And I think there was something like 20,000 uh, updates to the document as she went along. So her patience is uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. So uh, the first step in developing this guide was they, the team had to gather up information uh, in a fairly quick manner, uh, which is a task in of itself when you talk about an agency as large as ours. Um, so for this, they actually reached out to Region 4 Safety Manager Connie Smith. Uh, she has some great skills as far as developing uh, smart sheets. So she's the one that developed that smart sheet that went out in a form of, an, uh, of a survey to all the region or all of ODOT's managers to gather information. And really what they were trying to do is identify what are those commonalities that we have at all of our facilities that we need uh, to address this COVID-19. Um, some of those things that came out of that were limited occupancies to uh, try to promote the six foot social distancing. There were posters that were designated to try to communicate the requirements to employees and customers. Uh, establishing uh, physical distancing monitors or social distancing monitors, which really uh, are still in place today. As unfortunately everyone knows, we're still dealing with COVID. And so this group is essential in, in communication lines across the state. If we need a message to go out quickly around COVID and social distancing or any, any changes, this group is really key. Um, they also established uh, engineering controls like physical barriers that I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, promoting teleworking. So currently we have more people telecommuting than we've ever had in the history of ODOT. Um, and then the folks that are still in the workplace, trying to encourage them to not stack our cubes right next to each other, but space people out so that we're, again, trying to create that social distancing of a six foot minimum. Another thing that was identified from this group was around cleaning, um, supplies, cleaning vehicles, equipment, office equipment. And so uh, from that discussion, the COVID-19 supply task team was developed. Um, that was part of the storeroom, the procurement, and office employee safety to try to evaluate what cleaning supplies do we need, what amount, uh, what sort of personal protective equipment, hand sanitizer, all of those kinds of things were identified out of that group. Um, and they still work on occasion uh, as issues rise up. Go ahead and change slides, Josiah. During the team's uh, reintegration, um, building this document, they identified some groups that had unique challenges in reopening and DMV was one of those. Uh, as you know, they do uh, a lot of work directly with the customers which in itself is a challenge, <laughs> not even mentioning the COVID-19, but uh, with that, uh, it presented some unique challenges. So DMV um, had, some, had some issues to deal with, and I, I have a short video. I'm just gonna, let's just jump right into the video. This uh, really kind of talks about how, how they identified one way of, of trying to open up safely um, and I'll talk more after the video. My name's Scott Tiener. I've been um, the uh, DMV safety manager. I've been with ODOT for about 16 years now with the pandemic that's going on. We've changed a lot of our practices in how people do their My name's Scott Tiener. I've been um, the uh, DMV safety manager. I've been with ODOT for about 16 years now with the pandemic that's going on. We've changed a lot of our practices in how people do their jobs and interact with the public. A big one is the sneeze guard that you see being installed today. It's meant to be a safety measure to keep our employees as well as the public safe and healthy. A sneeze guard is a non-touch surface. It's really important that folks know that. The type of material it's made out of get easily scratched. We try to get folks not to touch the sneeze guard. <laughs> One employee put it really well. He said, you know, I think this is really going to improve morale. They're really excited about having this installed in our offices. It's going to be across all 60 field offices statewide. Our goal is to have these installed and up and ready to greet customers when they come in when they start to open up. I think it's nice. I think the customers are going to appreciate it, and I know the employees appreciate it. Thank you. 
So, you know, when I, when I think about uh, the word resiliency, ODOT really comes to mind. And Action it was part. a- Signs and traffic. Sorry. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah? Okay. So like I was saying, resiliency, ODOT is something that you hear resiliency a lot. I think I've heard that word used in some of the other presentations during this, this time. And it was that resiliency and that can-do approach to challenges that really brought ODOT together as one when it came to installing these shields. I mentioned 60 offices. There's actually 58 offices statewide that had uh, multiple shields in each office installed. Uh, and thanks to the highway maintenance folks and facilities folks who volunteered to help out, um, all of these shields were installed, uh, many within 24 hours, and all of them were done within a week, which was an unbelievable amount of uh, how quickly it was done. Uh, and that one ODOT approach didn't stop there. Uh, they continued because uh, the field offices needed more than just shields to open, right? There was other things. The constant collaboration between multiple divisions on many levels prepare our offices to open back up. Um, increased cleaning uh, with our contracts, with our cleaning crews, signage, personal protective equipment that was all brought out of the re, uh, um, our, our work group that did the uh, resiliency work group. Um, also identifying alternatives to things that DMV has traditionally done in the office. So. One of the things that had to change was because of COVID and six foot social distancing, um, we changed from just walk-in uh, appointments to uh, calling and making appointments in our offices. So once they made that announcement to the public, um, we had 18,000 calls come into our phone lines. It actually crashed the phone system completely. Uh, that's just a small example of how how many customers they deal with on a daily basis. It just overwhelmed the system. It was really surprising. And again, ODOT the, as one came together and worked on that issue and got it resolved. So DMV continues its commitment to safety of its customers and its employees. Um, and it continues to look at innovative ways of changing how it's doing business now to accommodate um, you know, COVID-19 and providing safety for its customers. So one of the things that's also done is there are new protocols to be put in place for drive tests um, with touchless thermometers, there's health questions, masks, gloves, seat covers for our examiners to get into the vehicles and, and safely uh, conduct those drive tests. So as ODOT moves forward during this pandemic, I think we all need to continue to work together as one ODOT to keep each other safe and continue to use technologies like we're using today um, for fall form. This is a great example of how COVID-19 has changed our world. And in some ways we've identified some real uh, gains and some, and some, you know, those, these innovative ways are really saving uh, a lot of work and making things more efficient. And so I think as we move forward, you're going to see some of those things stick around. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. Josiah, great back work. to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, uh -oh. So our next uh, safety story is going to be on railroad safety. And I think this is, in my view, a perfect example of one, identifying a safety problem, identifying a non-compliance, and coming up with the solution to make sure that um, the people working on the railroads are um, operating and working daily in a safe manner. So uh, Kristen Kiefer is the statewide utility and ra railroad analyst. And Tim McKenzie, who is the safety manager from Region 2, is the one that actually recommended um, in presenting this story um, for this section. So Kristen, I'll, I'll turn over the microphone to you. Sounds good. So with this topic, what it mainly was is Tammy Saldivar, our state utility and rail liaison, and I were traveling around the state giving a presentation on railroads. And it became very clear that most regions didn't even know what specific PPE was required to be on site at the railroad. There was a lot of conflicting information they were getting, and they were also not sure who this specifically applied to. 
So um, we reached out to Union Pacific because they are the most strict when it comes to PPE, um, down to the specific colors that we are and aren't allowed. So we assumed, and I've confirmed with our other railroads that if we follow Union Pacific's requirements, then we're covering all of the requirements for the railroads. So on the next slide, you'll see I'm doing a pop quiz because who misses these? <laughs> and there are four things wrong with this picture. Um, if we're just gonna sit here for just a few seconds and then we'll move on to the next screen that talks about what they are. But I was, I would have thought everything was great until I'd had my meeting with Union Pacific. So it was very informative. So I'll sit here for just a second and let you all look. Okay, I can't wait any longer. Let's go. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, so Union Pacific has specified that the vest must be orange if you're an ODOT employee or contract worker, because yellow is the color of UP engineers. Red is never allowed on any clothing, vest, or hard hats because that is their emergency stop color. So if you are wearing red, don't go near the railroad. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big no-no. We got in a lot of trouble for that one. Uh, eye protection, you are only allowed to wear sunglasses if they are prescription. Otherwise, you have to wear safety glasses. Um, he's not wearing a hard hat, which I'm sure everyone caught that one. And then you're supposed to wear hearing protection unless you're like at a diagnostic or something where you're with a rail representative. Obviously, you're not going to have hearing protection because you can't talk. But if you're working on the railroad, you need to have hearing protection. So the next two slides just show all the specific requirements. Um, they do require that it's the high-vis vest, so it comes down to your arms. It doesn't just cut off at your shoulders. Um, the hard hat is kind of a no-brainer. Um, hand protection, they want you to wear gloves on the railroad because things can be hot because it gets hot out there in the summer and then cold when it's winter. And then you'll note down below, oh, go back one more, go back. Um, you'll note down below some little things down here that, if you do like hot work or fall protection, they also have specific gear for your pants and coveralls and things like that. Like if you're welding, obviously you have totally different set of PPE. And this does not apply to vendors or truck drivers who are planning on staying in their vehicle. Okay, one more. And then the eye protection and the shoe. You have to have a one inch defined heel, has to have hardened toes, and it needs to be laced up to the ankles. So flip-flops are no-go. Um, dockers, unless they're steel-toed, are no-go. Um, we wear, a lot of people are wearing capris or shorts or skirts, has to be pants. So it's just kind of a good lesson learned, keep this in your back pocket kind of information I wanted to present. Kristen, thank you so much. I mean, personal protective equipment is one of those things that you can easily get cited for if you're non-compliant with it. So, you know, to me, I did not know that ODOT had, was working with railroads. And to me, so it was fascinating to me to hear this. And, and really, it was an eye-opening for me and educational. So thank you very much, Kristen, for that presentation. Of course, thank you. Absolutely. So the next one is going to be on safety learning groups. And Dave Wagner um, from, is a transportation maintenance specialist too in Region 3 Bridge Maintenance Crew. And also Barbara, who is the safety manager from Region 3. Um, Barbara actually recommended uh, this safety story uh, for this presentation. So I will turn it over to Dave and Barbara. Thank you, Josiah. So in Region 3, we've been actively working for quite some time to build a collaborative approach to incident analysis and hazard mitigation that's really focused on learning and engaging with the experts in the work. And those are the people who actually do the work, the boots on the ground, and empowering them to have a voice 
in the process and um, contribute to the safety solutions. So this means that whenever there's an incident or trend analysis or hazard identification that identifies a learning opportunity, then the safety office, the safety manager, the safety committees, the managers, the safety reps, and the crew members work together to understand uh, why the incident occurred or the issue occurred, and then find practical and meaningful solutions to them. So sounds pretty good, right? But what does it really look like in practice? Um, so today we're gonna share a recent success story that really took this to a whole new level. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dave to um, tell us how it all played out and we can advance the, the slide. Thanks for the introduction today, Barbara. Um, we, uh, several months ago, we were sitting here in, matter of fact, this conference room here, this training room, and we, uh, we started talking, we noticed we had a lot of um, sweeper incidents that were happening uh, throughout our region. And so we started talking about that and kind of what exactly that looked like as far as um, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna put together an expert, an expert panel? Are we going to, um, are we gonna talk about that? And I just, as the paper came around, I looked at it and I happened to notice that the majority of the incidents that were on that piece of paper uh, came from our, our crew at Coos Bay. And so I just, I had asked Barbara and the rest of the team that was here on the safety committee, I, I said, well, being that a lot of these incidents do come from the Coos Bay shop, is there any way that I could take this back to our crew and we could have a crew level discussion about what that looks like and how we can possibly move forward and not continue to have any more of these incidents in the future. And after a brief discussion, everybody agreed that that would be a good, good idea and that'd be a good possible way to um, mitigate this for the future so that we didn't continue to have these, these incidents. And so uh, I was able to take that back and, and backing up a little bit. So the issue that we were having on one of our large scale pickup rooms, um, on the back of it where the rear deck broom is at, there's a, a chute that comes down and has two feet on both sides that drag along the ground as you're, uh, as you're sweeping, you're picking that material up. And what happens is there are shoes on both sides. And when you come into a tight turn, those shoes will actually can, can bend if they get under pressure, they get un, uneven ground. Uh, grind inlay is a big one that we do where you actually cut a hole in the, in the pavement and then try to drop that in there and sweep that. Um, so what we realized was we realized that, that the machine was possibly being used in a, in a wrong manner. So we brought that back to our crew who's just, that crew at Davis Saloon and Coos Bay, they're just, they're really a group of safety champions. They really wanna do the best work possible. And as we started discussing it, that's a shared piece of equipment so we have it for a short amount of time. And what we were doing was we were actually using that machine probably a little bit past what the scope of the design was for. We have a lot of uh, approaches, driveways that are um, rather sharp. And we were really trying to pick that up so that the traveling public had a, had a good product when we were done with it. Um, so we talked together as a, as a team and we just decided um, with Tim Waller, our maintenance manager, our leadership team, as well as all the crew involvement, uh, we talked to our, our lead sweeper operators and we just got really good feedback as far as what does that look like? Where, how can we fix this to where it's, it's not going to happen again? And it was one of those awesome situations where everyone's engaged and everyone that had something to do with it, which is most of the crew, all had a little piece of just an oversight that, that others in the room were like, yeah, you know, shoot, if we'd have thought about that, you know, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have done that. So it was just a really, really good opportunity for this crew down here in Coos Bay to take ownership in the safety program and to actually bring that back to the safety committee and say, okay, so here is the end result. Here's what we were, um, what we came up with. And so we, we did, we brought that information back to the safety committee here. Once again, in, in this room I'm sitting in now and, and we shared these findings with, with other crews and they were able to take that information back to their crews and to, and to share. And since then, um, we haven't had any more, more incidents. And I just want to reiterate the fact that this particular incident, this wasn't a abuse of a piece of equipment. What this was is we were just saying, you know, we do have this for such a short period of time and we want to make sure that we, we get the best possible product. So um, we were able to have that learning. And what the, the end result was is, is we talked about it and we were no longer going to use it on unlevel surfaces. Um, definitely not use it any more grind inlay type, uh, type projects. And, um, and yeah, and it, it's, it's just really neat to see that in this region, it's, it's a, it's a top-down safety, uh, safety attitude. It comes from the very top. It's not, a, it's not disciplinary. It's not, I, wow, well, you know, I had an accident. I had something happen. And so I, I don't want to report it. I don't want to say anything because I don't want to, uh, to get in trouble or have repercussion because of it. 
it's a complete learning environment here. And I came out of the private sector for 11 years and, uh, you know, incidents, you didn't ever want to turn them in because you knew that there would be, there'd be disciplinary, you'd be in trouble for it. So um, coming to ODOT in Region 3, where we have the safety culture of we're going to share and we're going to learn from this and move forward, uh, has been just amazing for me um, to see that and for our crew down there at Davis Saloon Coos Bay. Um, and one of the things is, you know, you, you say with something like this, a small incident, you say, well, you know, sure, it's, it's easy to share when it's not a big deal, when it's not a, a big issue. And unfortunately, right after I started here with ODOT, I was about four months in, I was still on my probationary period. I, uh, I had a big incident. I had a, a, a very large scale incident happen. Um, it was, um, yeah, it was bad. And luckily no one was hurt, no one was killed, but it, it could have been very bad. And uh, my manager and the district manager, it was the day after Thanksgiving. So um, they, were, they were out of the area and they came down to the area. And when they got there, after you know, a brief description of what had happened, I looked at our district manager and I just, I told him, I said, you know, I go, I'll just, uh, I'll be getting my stuff when I get back shot and I'll be, be going down the road. And he looked at me and he said, no, Dave, he said that, no, no, absolutely not. I said, what we're gonna do is like, we're gonna figure out what happened and we're gonna learn from it. And that was something that tremendously impacted me was the fact that, wow, because 80% of the companies that I would work for in the private sector, there have been no hard feelings. It would have just been, you were down the road. And that's not the way Darren does business in this region. It's, we're going to figure out what happened, we're going to learn from it, and we're going to try to not ever have that happen again. So the safety culture here in Region 3, I can't speak for the rest of the state, but I can say that here, the safety culture is great. We have some really good safety champions here in this area, people that safety is their number one priority. And this picture of people on this crew here in front of me, this is our crew in Coos Bay at Davis Slough. And each and every one of them takes safety to the highest standard. And I know that when I'm not doing things, this crew has my back and they know I've got there. So it's just, it's a tremendous crew. And uh, when you come down there to Coos Bay, if you see one of our work zones, give us a little honk and a wave. So thanks guys for the opportunity to share today. And uh, we'll turn it back over to Barbara. Thanks Dave for sharing. Unmute. Thanks Dave for sharing. Um, this was a really exciting um, example for, for me because it really came, the solution really came from the people who do the work. And that means that they're invested in the long-term success and cultural change of the solutions they've identified. And um, as Dave mentioned, we recently looked at the data again for the past year and we have not had any repeat incidents. So um, that's a real success. Key point that I wanted to highlight here is that the vital role that our safety committee reps like Dave play in being that liaison between their crew and the safety committee. Um, not only bringing issues to the table, but then also reporting out the lessons learned um, from, from the other crews that come across the safety committee um, table so that everybody can benefit from those lessons learned. And we can also see the important role that accurate data and incident tracking plays in informing and focusing our efforts in safety around the areas that we can really make a difference, that we can make um, real change. So this collaborative and inclusive approach has really fostered a positive learning focused safety culture in the region. And, and I'm seeing that across the state as well. So it's really been successful and um, really excited about it. Wow, Barbara, David, thank you so much. I mean, I think what stood out to me there, I mean, I just kept thinking safety champions. Um, and you need those. You need those people to advance our safety culture. And you guys, uh, Zach, uh, your whole team exemplifies that. So thank you, David. Please pass on um, our thank you to them and continue that great work. So our final presentation for today is going to be Ted Miller, who is the maintenance and operations manager from Region 1. Um, and Ryan is not here with us, um, who is the operations policy analyst from Region 1, and also John, um, who actually uh, presented and, and gave the recommendation in presenting this story um, to this. So, uh, John Price, uh, John Price, um, Ted, take it away, please. All right. Thank you, Josiah. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, got some good stuff so far there. I just kind of wanted to, to go through and give a, a quick overview of our uh, hazard alert pilot system. Um, I won't go into a lot of details, but you know, we've had some incidents in the past, um, some mowing incidents. Um, and so uh, John and I were uh, just kind of 
chatting in my office up in region one and uh, the director happened to walk by and we started talking about an incident that happened in region three. Um, and, you know, everybody was, uh, you know, everybody across the state was concerned about what happened and concerned about the employees. And we, uh, we just thought to ourselves, well, technology has got to be, you know, get ourselves uh, a way to uh, help the situation that we were in. We also see a lot of um, mower damage. Uh, mower damage um, when you hit things out in the, out in the, in the field can add up to uh, a lot of repair time, a lot of downtime. So we were trying to uh, think out of the box of a way that we could um, prevent some of those damages. Um, still at this point in the pilot, we don't see that we could prevent 100% of the um, accidents that happen out there with mowing, um, finding stuff out there in the grass. But we thought at least if we could reduce that a certain percentage, that we could make some headway on this thing. Region one originally uh, bought a FLIR system and went out, had our folks put it on a tractor. It was our first version of first phase one of our pilot. Worked out really good. We saw the need to actually ramp this up a little bit um, and hopefully make it just a little bit more reliable. We hired LSA, Land Sea uh, Air Autonomy. Um, great group of folks. We gave them uh, the goal of coming up with some software uh, and a system that we could put together in a John Deere tractor that would look out in front of it and recognize objects. Um, they, they pulled out this thing out in about two months. Um, we have three tractors out there, one in Portland, one in Salem, and one in uh, District 7. Um, and uh, we haven't gotten to do a lot of mowing and testing with it yet. We did have, you know, of course, the fires that came that kind of set us behind a little bit, but we're really, really excited about this pilot and see what it's going to bring to us uh, over the next uh, mowing season and uh, kind of show us uh, if there is a percentage in reduction of accidents that could be had um, with the system. And so uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide, Jos Josiah. And, um, John, take it away. Um, so as Ted mentioned, um, we did start out with an earlier system. So um, when initially we were tasked uh, by the director to come up with a plan, it was to look at some sort of uh, some, some sort of opportunity or an idea how we could avoid um, how we could avoid living organisms, um, whether it's human or animal. And um, we did come up with that. We actually had a, an early version that was an analog system um, that was uh, forward-looking infrared, infrared radar thermal imaging. It worked. It worked well. However, one of the things that um, that uh, we ended up coming up with um, in conversations with Carl Raschke's from Fleet was, is there a way that we can avoid some of the damage that we have uh, that, to the mowing tractors that ends up being really costly? So, and it can also be dangerous to the, to the operators of the, of the mow tractors, just given that, you know, it could end up being propane tanks, it could be fuel, it could be a lot of different things that could cause some damage. Um, and also be um, hazardous to the operator as well. So in those course of those conversations, we started finding out that there were algorithms that we could, that could be explored with regard to um, technology and then also looking at um, artificial intelligence. And so what we ended up doing in, in partnering with LSA on this was heading towards that opportunity. And so this is really um, uh, a step uh, into a uh, into an really advanced area. This is cutting edge stuff that nobody else is doing. Um, there aren't any other uh, transportation departments that are using anything like this um, around the world. So ODOT's really on the forefront of of this, if you will, cutting edge technology. And so we've got object identification that we're looking at, geometric shape identification. In addition to a color camera, we also have an infrared camera, and we're looking at um, if we, it, you know, looking at some other uh, other options um, as we move forward that might help 
in integration to really expand the system to help us save money by way of avoiding uh, equipment damage that can really end up being costly. Any of you that have had to, had, had to sign for that, you, you know what it looks like. Um, but then also to really help us um, as far as um, looking out for whether it's wildlife or, or human life um, to avoid those possibilities there. So that's kind of how we got started um, in moving forward. Um, we're still we're still in conversations and we're looking really looking forward to the next mowing season. So we're kind of we're kind of we're uh, we're circling the wagon, so to speak, and, and doing a lot of review and having a lot of conversations. And um, I hate to say that this is classified information. So I won't. <laughs> it's, not, it's not classified. But that being said, um, Josiah, if you can roll that video, it'll really it'll really kind of flesh this out for you guys. Very good. And I'll let go ahead and go ahead, Deborah. My name is Ryan Sexton. I'm an operations and policy analyst for Region 1. It's a compact region, but there's plenty of lane miles to keep us busy. Oftentimes, we're asked to come in and deal with a lot of the more challenging issues. Homelessness on the state highway system is a big problem. That's on one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is we get to come out and do uh, these fun and interesting projects uh, like the hazard alert system. As you know, trash, tires, unsecured loads, it ends up on the side of the highway. Well, you get some grass that grows up around that and all of a sudden it's hidden. When we come out to mow, become a hazard to the mower and that's downtime for us we're looking for a way to detect these objects before we run them over so we've partnered up with lsa they're doing the development work so we use a, a camera system uh, it's a combination of a color camera and also a, a infrared camera and so that helps us see through grass to detect an object that might be hidden we've got our prototype unit installed and the ball dock tractor just taking some video with the prototype system on and live we set up a training course test course if you will tires carpet lumber wood propane tanks things like that we let the hazard system see those objects return that video to our contractor where they can begin to teach the computer to get better at recognizing objects we are teaching the system to detect people and wildlife. That is part of the driving force behind this effort. The hope is that eventually we do enough testing to teach the system to be able to detect objects all the time for us. It's important because it prevents damage to our equipment and downtime to our operations. If we can get better at avoiding them, we can just get all that much better at doing the work we need to do every day. I've been on a couple of projects like this now. There's a lot of innovation. I think technologies can be harnessed to do our job more efficiently and safer. And to be on kind of on the cutting edge of some of that stuff is, is really fun and, and definitely an honor. Very nice. Let me go ahead and go back to my screen and we'll finish out this section. All right. So uh, thank you to Drew, Julie Murray, uh, producer of that video with the drone and, and uh, Ryan Sexton's our project manager. Um, what's next? What's next is just getting our system to uh, learn what to see out there. And the way it's going to learn what to see is, is just being out in the field, um, doing some testing, getting some actual mowing done, getting feedback from all three regions that have the system. Um, feedback from the employees, um, you know, what's needed is the, you know, because there's enough stuff going on in that tractor um, that they need to pay attention to. We want to make this system as uh, something that's, that's there, but not something that hinders the safety of their operation, but gives them extra, extra level or extra set of eyes, if you will. Um, as you can see in this picture, our system will draw circles around propane tanks, uh, people as you see, cars, guardrail. It'll it'll make out. It, it does uh, the color cameras there. Um, it can see heat signatures. Um, it has an audible alert, so the, the driver, the mower operator, does not have to keep their eye on the screen all the time. Um, we do have a lot of work to do on this, but it's pretty exciting, and we're looking forward to reporting out. Um, 
how this thing goes out into the future. I don't know, John, if you have any more. I think that make uh, you, you nailed it, Ted. Um, it's um, I think it's a great advancement. One we've already uh, we've we've already had uh, uh, rumors of what we're doing um, circulating among other among other DOTs, and we've been getting some uh, some probing calls from them, so to speak. But um, um, we're still in development, and it's it's um, when when it comes to new technology development. It's a big deal, and it uh, and it we need to do this the right way. So, uh, thank you guys. Yeah, I, I would, really appreciate the opportunity to share this off. I would also Andrews. add that I would also add just one more thing, real quick. That um, we've so far the cost of the system um, to install into the tractor is also one of those things that uh, we can see is uh, one one gnarly hit to a propane tank or a tire with a wheel on it, the tractor would actually pay for this system. So it's not a real expensive system at all. But thank you guys and uh, look forward to reporting out more. Ted and John, thank you so much. I mean, that's very innovative. Like you said, it's cutting edge technology and what do you think outside the box um, and improving safety. So thank you. And Bobby, I know we're towards the end of our time um, and thank, I think we're over, but I just want to close out this presentation with this in recognizing that as we continue to improve our culture of safety, recognize that uh, we're never gonna con we're never gonna end trying to pursue and improving our safety culture. It is a journey; it's not a destination. So it requires all of our employers to really embrace our um, our safety core value and living that every day in, in in what we do in our job. So. Thank you all very much, and I'll take some questions if uh, folks are still willing to stay behind. It looks like uh, we have one enthusiastic comment, safety is fun. And then we have one question, what role does OSHA play in our safety program, and do we partner with their consultants at all? Absolutely. Yes. So OSHA is not just a regulatory body that says you guys did something bad and we're going to fine you. One of they are in my perspective is that they are partners, right? They have expertise, they have consultants and their job ha is equal to ours in making sure that we go home at the end of the day to have dinner with our family and friends. Right. So we to me, I partner with them. I've used them a lot in my previous jobs in other agencies where I invite them to do consultations and, and just get their expert opinion. Right. Um, and I think when you approach OSHA that way, that they are partners in what we're trying to accomplish, that tends to be more successful in the long run in, in terms of compliance and also employee safety. That concludes the questions that we have for this session, and I think concludes the session as well. Thank you all, all the speakers. Thank you again for all your time and effort and continue the great work you guys are doing. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Bobby. Very welcome. Thanks, Josiah. Thank you.